Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Welcome. We are continuing our discussion in the prophetic fulfillment of the antitypical Day of Atonement. This is the seventh installation in this feast day section. It's so important because we are living in that time of the Day of Atonement because it's been taking place ever since 1844. The last few sermons we've labored to set in stone the start date of 557 BC and see at every single turn that the, the fulfillments that were in Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27, that at every turn those dates were fulfilled to a T. So today we are going to look at, because remember that was cut off from the rest of the prophecy, the rest of the time prophecy, as we learned and we looked at. So the full time prophecy is actually the 2300 days given in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14. So today, what we are going to look at is we are going to look at that time period, 1844, and see what actually happened, specifically surrounding the date and time of fulfillment of that prophecy. So as we begin, let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Father in heaven, Please help us to understand your prophecies. Help us to understand the lessons you would have us to learn from the Day of Atonement, the antitypical Day of Atonement, the fulfillment of it, and the Millerite movement. Help us to understand the great lessons you are trying to have your people understand so that they can tell others. Father, we ask that the Holy Spirit would be here with us, that iron would sharpen iron, that you would hide the speaker behind your cross, and through the foolishness of preaching, enliven minds to understand your will. In Jesus' name, amen. So, as a quick recap, this is the 490-day or year prophecy. And it's discussed in weeks. This is, this is actually the only place that I know of where it's broken up into weeks. It's only weeks. It's not days or months. Sometimes we see months. Um, or years, three and a half years, like you see in Daniel chapter 7. It's all weeks. And I think that's because it says that, you know, after, after the 62 weeks and the really after the 69 weeks, that's when the Messiah would be cut off. Well, it doesn't mean that exact date. It means sometime in, the, in that last week, right? And as we looked at, it said that in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to see. So we were looking for the three and a half year prophecy, which is exactly what we found. So if we look at the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, which was Artaxerxes' commandment recorded in Ezra chapter 7, we see that the start date is 457 BC. We add the 49 years that was given, the seven weeks, plus the 62 weeks, which would give us 69 weeks, or 483 literal years. And that's when the Messiah, the Prince, would show up onto the scene. That brings us to AD 27. That's when we see Jesus beginning his ministry at his baptism. There you have Jesus, who is God the Son. You have God the Father speaking from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You have the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus as a dove, of which it was what he was anointed with, which is what the prophecy says, to anoint the most holy. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. That's what the oil means. So he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and confirmed as if he needed any more confirmment. But he, can, he was confirmed again through John the Baptist as well, who was 
a son of a Levitical priest, probably the highest spiritual authority as far as bloodlines national Israel is concerned, the highest spiritual authority that could be uh, encapsulated in a human being was in John the Baptist. And he affirmed Jesus' ministry. That happened in 27 AD, just as the prophecy said, 483 years and the Messiah would be anointed, the Most Holy would be anointed. Now we get in our last week. The, the last week, Jesus confirms the covenant. For one week, the Messiah would confirm the covenant. We saw that if you look at all the Passover visits in Scripture, you find that exactly filled to a T, you come to a three and a half year mark where Jesus is cut off or the sacrifice and oblation ceases in 31 AD at the Passover time, the exact midst or the halfway point of the last prophetic week of Daniel chapter 9. When you go further, another three and a half years, you see that the pro this probationary time, remember the 490 years was cut off or separated as a special allotted probationary time for the nation of Israel specifically. So basically what God was telling Daniel was that the nation of Israel has 490 years from, from the start of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to get their act in order. If they do not, then the message is going to go from them uh, to another people who will produce the fruits, right? Just like Jesus' parable of the vineyard, right? You had men in the vineyard, and he would send servants, and they would beat them. Some of them they would kill. And finally, the master of the vineyard said, I will send my son. Him they will reverence, right? And what did they do? They killed him. And Jesus asked the Pharisees, and they knew that he was talking about them. It says that in there. He asked the Pharisees, what will the master of the, the vineyard do? He said, well, they'll, they'll destroy those wicked men and lent it out to other servants who will bring forth the, the fruits. And that's what he, exactly what he said. Therefore, the vineyard is taken away from you and given to another nation who will produce the fruits. So that's exactly what happened. In 34 AD, the nation of Israel uh, finally signed the death knell on this. They stoned Stephen. His death is extremely similar to Jesus's. Both Jesus and Stephen, shortly before they died, gave a message of rebuke to Israel, which had zero uh, redemptive qualities in it. Unlike the prophets of old, who always had a message of redemption in every judgment message they gave. So not like Jeremiah's messages, not like Isaiah's messages, but there was a message of judgment with no redemptive qualities. Both Stephen and Jesus died innocent of what they were being called into question for. Stephen and Jesus both asked for pardon for their persecutors. Lay not this sin to their charge. Stephen and Jesus both said that they commend their spirit to the Lord. They handed over their spirit to God. So that was the final week and that was the final point in which the allotted probationary time for the nation of Israel was given. It ended at that point, and at that point, which is Acts chapter 7 and beyond, we see the message go to the Gentiles. So, it's a perfect fit for 1844 as well. So now that we've confirmed all these signposts in this, in this prophecy, we can be secure in knowing that if we do the math on the 457 B.C. time, start time, for the 2300 days that we will come to the correct point in history. And what does that point in history lead us to? 457 BC brings us to 1844 AD. In 1844 AD, we're looking at the antitypical or heavenly sanctuary to be cleansed at that time. 
just like it says in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. Now, let's take a look at exactly what happened with the Millerites. This is from a book by James White, Sketches of the Christian Life and Public Labors of William Miller, page 182. William Miller, throughout his, uh, throughout his ministry, up to and leading up to 1843 and 1844, he had given the year, but he had not, he had not given any dates, exact dates and time of when he thought Jesus would return. Because remember, the problem with the, their interpretation of Scripture here is that they believe that the cleansing of the sanctuary is the cleansing of the earth by fire. They are saying that the earth is the sanctuary, which of course we know is not true. The sanctuary is the sanctuary that's in heaven, spoken of by Hebrews chapter 8 and chapter 9. So this is what he does. This is, at this point, William Miller is prodded and prodded and prodded by the people to give dates. Sounds similar to today, right? Well, William Miller, sadly, he finally caves into this request, and this is what he said. My principles in brief are that Jesus Christ will come again to this earth, cleanse, purify, and take possession of the same with all the saints sometime between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. And he was basing that time period off of the rabbinic calendars, which was a problem because there were errors in that calendar. So his time period extends one full year from March 21st, 1843, up to March 21st, 1844. And this was the chart this was the chart that they had published talking about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the, the vision of Daniel chapter 2, and then the vision of Daniel chapter 7, and the vision of Daniel chapter 8, along with the dates calculated up to 1843. So they had calculated it up to 1843, and the reason they got to that date is again because of that mistake in the calendar. You see, the only way I can help make sense of it is this. Um, the, the, the calendars that we use today are not the same ones, obviously, that they had used in the past. When a monarch, especially a monarch, back in ancient times, the Jews included, when they would take possession of a, a kingdom, right? Uh, even if the first year of their possession was just two months before the next year, they would still be counted as a ruler for the whole year. Now, also, their time of starting the next year would be in, in the fall. So when they would start their year, it would be in the fall that the next year would be in place. So if you're doing the math on that, then you have, you have a certain amount of months, right, that are actually going to be in our, our uh, Gregorian calendar year that wouldn't be considered part of the same year in the ancient calendars. So let's take a look at this. This is from a book by uh, Leroy Froome, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 4, written in, uh, well, republished probably in 1982, page 796. And I'm using this quote specifically to show you exactly what happened with the calendars specifically. That's the context of the quote. So as far back as April, and then in June and December of 1843, and in February of 1844, months before Miller's original date expired for the ending of the Jewish year 1843, at the same time of the vernal equinox in 1844, his associates, Sylvester Bliss, Josiah Litch, Joshua Himes, Nathaniel Southard, Apollos Hale, Nathan Whiting, and others came to a definite conclusion. This was the solution of Daniel's prophecy. This was that the solution of Daniel's prophecy is dependent upon the ancient or original Jewish form of loony solar time 
and not upon the altered modern rabbinical Jewish calendar, which was the one they were using. They therefore began to shift from Miller's original date for the ending of the 2300 years at the equinox, March 21st, in March over to the new moon of April 1844. So that's why there was a shift originally. The first, there's a couple shifts here. Originally, it's March 21st to March 21st, 1843 to 1844. Then they shifted again because now they're looking at the new moon in, in 1844, which would take place in April, about a month later. It goes on, it says, uh, uh, let me repeat that. They therefore began to shift from Miller's original date for the ending of the 2300 years at the equinox in March over to the new moon of April 1844. Okay, so I read that. So they shifted it one month to try to correct for the problem with the rabbinical calendar they were using. And now I want to point out there have been issues with the Jewish calendars. This is why it's really important. It's really important to mention this because when we get on the subject of uh, uh, Jesus died on Wednesday, things like that, what people will do is they'll take, they'll take the Jewish rabbinical calendar and they will turn the clock back to AD 31. And guess what day the Passover falls on in AD 31, according to the rabbinical calendar? It's not a Friday. It's Wednesday. But there's problems with the rabbinical calendar. There's been errors. And this is one of the errors that is pointed out by Jonathan Gray. In his book, The Forbidden Secret, page 29, he says, Rabbis Akiva and Ben Halafta also slashed out 160 years from the Persian Jewish calendar to nullify the named ones, who's Jesus, fulfillment of the Daniel's 490-year prophecy. That's right, 160 years of real time was ripped out and thrown away. So back in the days of the apostles, they messed with the calendar and ripped out 160 years just so that they could say that Jesus was not the fulfillment of the 490-year prophecy, the things that we've been going over. So was it ever put back together correctly? Who knows? Obviously not if William Miller's calculations were off and then their new moon calculation was off after that. They had problems with this calendar. That's why when people do their research on the Jesus died on Wednesday thing, you'll get all sorts of answers. I've seen the Passover ending on a Monday, a Wednesday, and all sorts of days of the week, depending on which Jewish calendar, rabbinical calendar, karyat calendar you're using. So just be real careful with that assumption. Real careful. So 1843, the spring passes. In 1844, the spring passes. Jesus doesn't return. These are my words here. After the time periods from March 21st, 1843 to March 21st, 1844, and then April 18th or 19th in 1844, that extra time added on, they came and went with no return of Jesus Christ. The Millerites were still hopeful and eager for Christ's return. And this is when the message of Habakkuk chapter 2, the tarrying time, was applied to the Millerites' experience in awaiting the fulfillment of the 2300 days. So people were still sort of uh, excited and hopeful at this point. Yes, they had had, they had had some disappointments, but they were applying the Habakkuk chapter 2 tarrying time to their experience. And this is what Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 2 through 4 says. It says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. Now, first of all, before this, before this first set of disappointments came, the Millerites applied this exact scripture to their creation of the chart by, Josiah, by Charles Fitch. And 
So they had already looked at this scripture and applied it to their experience. So it's quite interesting that after their first couple of disappointments, they then apply this section. It says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So again, uh, uh, telling people to live by faith and have faith, and that's what the Millerites were experiencing at this time. Paul? Uh, yeah, and going back to William Miller finally predicting a time, he did not want to do that. No, he, was, he didn't. He was pressured into that by... The, I don't remember the man's name, one specific individual, and this was a political thing. And this is a, a, an object lesson. Do not do this. William Miller did not want to do this. No. He gave in to peer pressure and to politics, and this is what happened. And he stepped off the path of the Holy Spirit's guiding him. So that's an object lesson to all these people today who want times, are predicting times. No. Absolutely. And he was sorry to his death that he ever did that. Absolutely. Yes, just like we were talking about before, it was at the prodding, constant prodding, that he gave those dates. He didn't want to do it. And it was a big mistake. But he had the courage to admit his mistake. This is from William Miller. He's quoted in Sylvester Bliss, his book called Memoirs of William Miller. Page 256, it was after the time periods had come and gone that William Miller realized his grave mistake in setting the times to begin with. And what is so um, redeemable, I would say, and respectable about this man, William Miller, is that he, he, unlike so many of our leaders today, he had the courage and bravery to admit his fault. And he admitted it in a public fashion. And he made sure that his reformatory work and being sorry for and repentance for that work went just as far as did the error. He was, as Paul said, he was sorry until the day of his death that he, had, that he had set a time, that he had caved in to the peer pressures that were all around him. But this is what he said. I don't know if this was published. It was published in a publication. But I don't know if this was published in the Midnight Cry or in the Signs of the Times. I'm not sure. But you can find it in the Sylvester uh, Bliss's book, Memoirs of William Miller, page 256. He says this. I confess my error and acknowledge my disappointment. Yet I still believe that the day of the Lord is near, even at the door. And I exhort you, my brethren, to be watchful and not let that day come upon you unawares. The wicked, the proud, and the bigot will exalt over us. I will try to be patient. God will deliver the godly out of temptation and will reserve the unjust to be punished at Christ's appearing. Folks, he was willing to admit that he was wrong for time setting. How different is that from individuals such as this, David Gates, who gave a time period and throughout his, his sermon that was shaking through Seventh-day Adventism at the time, he said over and over and over again, and I have the clips, that God was telling him this. And in the beginning of it, what did he say? He said, I'm not time setting. And then he gave dates that anybody with a brain could use to calculate actual times of what would take place, whether it was the ceiling, as he said, it could be the, could be the ceiling, not necessarily Christ's return. But it could be the ceiling or the, the, the time period we're given for the Sunday law or whatever it was. Folks, I am I'm saddened. I'm saddened uh, that so many people, and Paul's right. This, all of this comes from the theory of evolution 
and this total rejection of reality to where people's words and actions don't have to match. Folks, anybody who tells you they're not time setting and then goes on to give you dates and speculations of events that are going to take place, they are time setting. How have we become so confused, so hard of hearing, so nearsighted, that we can't see that if so, just because somebody tells us that they're not doing something, that doesn't mean they're not doing it. Jesus said, judge them by their words, fruits. What's that? Their actions, their deeds. Folks, I can sit up here and tell you that I'm not giving a sermon. It's something else. Does that make it true? Of course not. It's like somebody digging a hole right in front of you. I'm not digging a hole. And, they're, and there they are. Folks, anybody, anybody who gives a time period, a start date, an event to take place, theologically speaking, guess what they're doing? They're time setting. And unlike William Miller, they beat around the bush as to why they were wrong. And they don't confess their error as did William Miller. As far as I know, David Gates has not done that. Most of the time he said, well, I never said this and I never meant that. And very political speaking right there. William Miller, unlike them, unlike them, William Miller confessed his error. William Miller was willing to admit he was wrong, and he did so publicly. Now, Mrs. White gives us a little bit of context about this era, what, what was happening at that time. This is from the book Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 241 and 242. It says, when the year 1843 entirely passed away, unmarked by the advent of Jesus, those who had looked in faith for his appearing were, for a time, left in doubt and perplexity. But notwithstanding their disappointment, many continued to search the scriptures, examining anew the evidences of their faith, and carefully studying the prophecies to obtain further light. The Bible testimony in support of their position seemed clear and concise, or, and conclusive. Signs which could not be mistaken pointed to the coming of Christ as near. The believers could not explain their disappointment, yet they, fully, yet they felt assured that God had led them in their past experience. Their faith was greatly strengthened by the direct and forcible application of those scriptures which set forth the tarrying time. As early as 1842, the Spirit of God had moved upon Charles Fitch to devise a prophetic chart which was generally regarded by Adventists as a fulfillment of the command given by the prophet Habakkuk to write the vision and to make it plain upon tables. No one, however, then saw the tarrying time which was brought to view in the same prophecy. After the disappointment, the full meaning of the scripture became apparent. And then she quotes that, that scripture that we read, that the tearing time, though it tarry, wait for it, it will not tarry. A portion of Ezekiel's prophecy was a source of much strength and comfort to believers. And the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth. Tell me, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. They of the house of Israel say, The vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of times that are afar off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done. And that's quoted from Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 21 through 25, 27, and 20, uh, 28. And they applied all those verses to the experience that they were going through at that time. And clearly being vindicated here by the Holy Spirit as those verses are applicable to the experience of the Millerites. So what happened? There was this 
sort of, there was still kind of a, a good feeling going on because of the tarrying time message. But that wouldn't be the last time that a date would be set. Comes on to the scene, Elder Snow, Samuel S. Snow. This became known as the true midnight cry or the seventh month message. This is what he said. In August 1844, so just, just right through the end of summer there, at a camp meeting in Exeter, New Hampshire, Millerite Samuel S. Snow preached the correct timing of the end of the 23-day year prophecy. Here is what Samuel Snow saw in the prophecy. He saw that the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem by Artaxerxes occurred in the fifth month, according to Ezra chapter 7, verse 8, putting the decree in the fall, not the spring, not the springtime, and the time for it to travel from Persia to Jerusalem pushes the date back a little bit further. So it actually, by the time it got to Jerusalem, it was in the seventh month, which is why this is called the seventh month, month message. He also saw that the cleansing of the sanctuary happened during the Day of Atonement, which was the 10th day of the seventh month. So he's getting closer, isn't he? He's getting closer to the truth now. The 10th day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement. That's when the sanctuary was cleansed. Now he's getting on the right track. He was using the Karyat calendar instead, which was a, a, obviously a precise calendar, in comparison to the rabbinical that they were using. And this would concur on October 22nd, 1844. This message was considered the seventh month message or the true midnight cry. So, at this point in time, the Millerites are re-energized with a new purpose. The midnight cry goes out to the world. The world is warned again. From Nathaniel Southard, the midnight cry, October 31st, 1844, he said this, the midnight cry or the seventh month message, it swept over the land with the velocity of a tornado and it reached hearts in different and distant places almost simultaneously. So the new date, October 22nd, 1844, the time of really the antitypical Day of Atonement, right? But the time of the Lord's return, as they were saying, that message again sweeped across the world and the people were warned one last time. Spirit of Prophecy gives us a little bit more uh, understanding. Great Controversy, page 398 and 399 says the preaching of the first angel's message and of the midnight cry tended directly to repress fanaticism and dissension. Those who participated in these solemn movements were in harmony. Their hearts were filled with love for one another and for Jesus, whom they expected soon to see. The one faith, the one blessed hope, lifted them above the control of any human influence and proved a shield against the assaults of Satan. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Come ye out to meet him. Then all, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Matthew chapter 25, verse 5 through 7. So they directly connected their experience with the midnight cry that was given with the ten virgin parable of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 25. The Holy Spirit goes on, the pen of inspiration goes on here. In the summer of 1844, midway between the time when it had been first thought that the 2300 days would end and the autumn of the same year to which it was afterward found that they extended, the message was proclaimed in the very words of scripture. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That which led to this movement was the discovery that the decree of Artaxerxes for the restoration of Jerusalem which formed, which formed the starting point for the period of the 2300 days, went into effect in the autumn of the year 457. And not at the beginning of the year, as has been formally believed. 
reckoning from the autumn of 457, the 2300 years terminate in the autumn of 1844. So what they figured out basically was this. They thought they had a couple errors. They were using the wrong calendar, one, which we went over. And number two, they thought that the decree went into effect at the beginning of the year. They missed the fact that Ezra chapter 7 says it was in the fifth month that it was given. It's two months travel from, from the palace in Sushan to Israel. So two months later, you have the seventh month message. Now, Samuel Snow connected those things together, and he also connected the fact that the sanctuary is cleansed on the Day of Atonement, which gives you an exact date, the 10th day of the seventh month. So the 10th day of the seventh month happened to be October 22nd, 1844. And they based this off of the parable of the ten virgins. Matthew chapter 25, verses 5 through 13, it says, While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, <clears throat> and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. He answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So Jesus directly connects it right there with the end time prophecies and the Millerites always Bible based in everything that they followed. Nothing was just fanatical emotionalism. Now some of that stuff was going on <clears throat> but their doctrines, their principles were founded upon the scriptures themselves every time. Great Controversy page 400 in the parable of Matthew chapter 25 the time of waiting and slumber is followed by the coming of the bridegroom. This was in accordance with the arguments just presented, both from prophecy and from the types. They carried strong conviction of their faith, of their truthfulness, and the midnight cry, <coughs> excuse me, the midnight cry was heralded by thousands of believers. Like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land. From city to city, from village to village, and into remote country places it went until the waiting people of God were fully aroused. Fanaticism disappeared before this proclamation like the early frost before the rising sun. Believers saw their doubt and perplexity removed and hope and courage animated their hearts. So their power went with the message. But as we all know, October 22nd came and Jesus did not return in the way they understood. He did not come and cleanse the earth by fire. What he did was he did what the Day of Atonement always showed, was that that was the one time in the year when the high priest would enter in before the Ark of the Covenant into the most holy place to be in the presence of God himself and to blot out the sins that were in the sanctuary and remove them through the Day of Atonement and the two goats. Mrs. White talks about their experience a little bit here. Great Controversy, page 405. And she connects it with the disciples in Jesus' day. Had the disciples realized that Christ was going to judgment and to death, they could not have fulfilled this prophecy. In like manner, Millerites and associates fulfilled prophecy and gave a message which inspiration had foretold should be given to the world, but which they could not have given had they fully understood the prophecies pointing out their disappointment. And presenting another message to be preached to all nations before the Lord should come. The first and second angel's message, because remember the second angel's message happened 
around the same time as the midnight cry, the call to come out of these other churches, that they are Babylon fallen, by Charles Fitch specifically, and many others. But Mrs. White goes on, the first and second angel's message were given at the right time and accomplished the work which God had designed to accomplish by them. The world had been looking on, expecting that if the time passed and Christ did not appear, the whole system of Adventism would be given up. But while many under strong temptation yielded their faith, there were some who stood firm. The fruits of the Advent movement, the spirit of humility and heart searching of renouncing the world and reformation of life, which had attended the work, testified that it was of God. They dared not deny that the power of the Holy Spirit had witnessed to the preaching of the second advent, and they could detect no error in their reckoning of the prophetic periods. So they could t detect no error at this point in their reckoning of the time. They are totally at a loss. Some, at this point, many actually, lost their faith completely. They had built on the sand. They hadn't studied these prophecies out for themselves. That's why it's so important. Uh, Pastor Hughes, myself, uh, Paul Prano, we, we mentioned so many times, that you, you gotta read it for yourself. You gotta study it for yourself. You can't just rely on other preachers. You gotta go and you gotta study and you gotta dig. Because the people that survived this great disappointment, spiritually speaking, that didn't lose their faith, they were the ones who did exactly that. They were the ones who studied. They were the ones who knew that the time periods, that there was no error there. It wasn't emotionalism. It was an intellectual faith that they had, and that's what we must have. Great Controversy, page 406. True, there had been a failure as to the expected event, but even this could not shake their faith in the word of God. When Jonah proclaimed in the streets of Nineveh that within 40 days the city would be overthrown, the Lord accepted the humiliation of the Ninevites and extended their period of probation. Yet the message of Jonah was sent of God and Nineveh was tested according to his will. Adventists believed that in like manner God had led them to give the warning of judgment. It has, they declared, tested the hearts of all who heard it and awakened the love for the Lord's appearing, or it has called forth a hatred, more or less perceivable, but known to God of his coming. It has drawn a line so that those who will examine their own hearts may know on which side of it they would have been found had the Lord then come. <coughs> Whether they would be whether they would have exclaimed, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. Or whether they would have called to the rocks and mountains to fall on them, to hide them from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. God thus, as we believe, has tested his people, has tried their faith, has proved them, and seen whether they would shrink in the hour of trial from the position in which he might see fit to place them, and whether they would relinquish this world and rely with implicit confidence in the word of God. The Advent Herald and Signs of the Times Reporter, uh, volume 8, number 14, given November 13th, 1844, and recorded in The Great Controversy, page 406. So God was testing their faith, and there was a time of great disappointment. It cut deep. It was hard. It was hard. If you could imagine expecting that the toils and trials and tribulations of this world were about to come to an end, that you were going to see the one whom you loved most in this world, which was Jesus Christ, that you would be able to spend eternity with him, and then to have all of that just slip through your fingers. Yes, God was testing them. But it was, a, it, was a, it was a trial for them. This is some of their experience here. Hiram Ebsen, in an undated manuscript of his life and experience, and this is quoted in George Knight's book, William Miller and the Rise of Adventism, written in 2010, page 184. Hiram Ebsen, he said this, Our fondest hopes and expectations were blasted. 
And such a spirit of weeping came over us as I had never experienced before. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comparison. We wept and wept till the day dawned. Could you imagine being that heartbroken and that sad that you would cry literally all night? He says, I mused in my own heart saying, my Advent experience has been the richest and brightest of all my Christian experience. If this had proved a failure, what was the rest of my Christian experience worth? Has the Bible proved a failure? Is there no God, no heaven, no golden home city, no paradise? Is all this but a cunningly devised fable? Is there no reality to our fondest hopes and expectation of these things? And thus we had for something to grieve and weep over, if all our fondest hopes were lost. And as I said, we wept till the day dawn. It was a tough experience, folks. It was a tough experience when they misinterpreted the event that was to take place. They were right on. They were right on with the time. But they misunderstood the event, just as the apostles had done the same. The disciples of Christ. They thought Jesus was going to come and take over Israel, become its king, shake off the shackles of Rome, and eventually conquer the entire world. They are expecting a return of a conquering king like David. They misunderstood his mission. They misunderstood his event that was to take place. That Jesus was coming to conquer the devil himself. And it's good for us to remember that the book, The Great Controversy, the full, the full title of it, is the great controversy between Christ and Satan. It doesn't say the great controversy between me and the world. It doesn't say the great controversy between God's people and the Pope, does it? The great controversy is between Christ and Satan. And that's what's really going on. And we have to realize that that's the spiritual warfare that we are engaged in. Hiram Edson, though his hopes seem shattered, he did not let go of his faith. He wanted to study further. He was praying for light like many others were. This from LineageJourney.com, an article on Hiram Edson, the farmer in the cornfield, it's what it's called. But LineageJourney.com, it talks a little bit about what happened. When October 23, 1844 dawned, and the little group of Millerites huddled in Edson's farm had managed to check the first outpouring of grief, Edson led the way to his barn. Here they gathered and spent the morning in prayer. After this season of prayer, Edson, accompanied by his friend Owen Crozier, that's the O-R-L Crozier that understood the daily, decided to make a trip across his cornfield. They wanted to visit some of their Millerite neighbors and encourage them. As they were making their way across the field, Edson stopped short and seemed to stare straight ahead. Puzzled, Crozier pulled to, to an abrupt stop behind him, calling out, Brother Edson, what are you stopping for? To which Edson replied, God is answering our morning prayer, giving light regarding our disappointment. Edson later explained that as he was walking, he felt as if, he had a, as if a hand was laid on his shoulder, and he seemed to have a vision of the heavenly sanctuary where he saw that Jesus had that very day entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the work of judgment. Crozier and Edson, along with their friend and neighbor Franklin Behan, spent the next several weeks and months poring over their Bibles, studying the themes of the sanctuary and judgment. In March of 1845, 
They published their findings in a small paper called The Day Dawn. Crozier, being a school teacher, wrote the article, while Edson and his wife sold their best silverware to raise money to fund the publication. And Han had the material published. Wow, so they published it from a sacrifice. Paul was talking about sacrifice this morning. They published it at a loss to themselves. Praise the Lord. I pray that that spirit would be imbued in us. But he was given the key. He saw that Jesus at that day had entered into the most holy place of the sanctuary. Now, the difference between this and other cult movements that try to spiritualize away things that don't happen on the days that they happen is that they didn't reinterpret Scripture after the fact. What they did was come to the correct understanding of what the Day of Atonement was always talking about the whole time. They misinterpreted the event that was to take place. Unlike cults today that will say, yes, we are going, <clears throat> we are going to have Christ return on such and such a date. And then they're out there and they're staring at the stars and then nothing happens. And they say, oh, well, Christ did return. It was a spiritual thing. Totally different than this, which was based off of Scripture. He saw that he had misunderstood the event. He was given a vision where he was looking into the heavenly sanctuary. And obviously, there was a, 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 a period of misunderstanding with him because he was crying so much about the disappointment. But as he went back, this is key. As he went back to his Bible and studied what the cleansing of the sanctuary meant, the Day of Atonement and the Day of Judgment, what all of those things really were pointing to, <clears throat> it was at that time that they understood that October 22nd, 1844 began the antitypical Day of Atonement, and Jesus went from the daily ministration into the yearly ministration. And this is what was lost, the daily that was taken away by the Roman Catholic Church. This was regained when Hiram Edson had this vision, the understanding of the sanctuary. Now, Mrs. White talks about him a little bit. This is Selected Messages, Book 1, page 206 and 207. She says, many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. My husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Elder Edson, and others who were keen, noble, and true were among those who, after the passing of the time of 1844, searched for the truth as for hidden treasure. I met with them, and we studied and prayed earnestly. Often we remained together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night praying for light and studying the word. Again and again, these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that we might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. When they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me and I would be taken off in vision and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me with the instruction as to how we were to labor and teach effectively. Praise the Lord. This is the breakdown, folks. The, the advent doesn't come, right? You have a majority of the people abandon their belief. Some go back to their old churches. Most leave the faith entirely. Thousands, tens of thousands of the 50,000. Another, no advent comes. They just start setting other dates. Hundreds of them do that. Another one says Jesus did come. It was spiritualized. And they start the Holy Flesh movement, and they end up joining the Shakers. Those who end up join, setting all these other dates, they start the Advent Christian Church and later on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Dozens, folks, dozens said that the date was right, but we misinterpreted the event that the cleansing of the sanctuary meant the pre-advent judgment. Dozens 
became the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And these, this will be our last quote. This was our last slide here. So we're out of time. But I wanted to point out that after 18, around 1844 and after 1844, you had all sorts of insane satanic things, principles, beliefs pop up throughout the world. Here's a few examples. Charles Taze Russell became the founders of Jehovah's Witnesses, was converted to Adventism by Jonas Wendell in 1870. Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species, in 1859. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels published the Communist Manifesto in 1844 or 1848. Offshoots of true Millerism founded Holy Flesh Movement, which was a pre-runner of Pentecostalism and the charismatic movements we see today. The Codex Sinaiticus, a corrupt version of the Bible, is hailed as the oldest, most reliable, discovered by a fake Protestant, Constantine von Tischendorf, with strong ties to Rome. And he found that Bible, the oldest Bible, in 1844. Civil war breaks out in the 1860s, and Rome tries to overthrow the United States. These are still the philosophies that we are living with today. Isn't that amazing? The charismatic movement has swept over Christianity like a tidal wave. Communism and so many other things. We're out of time, folks. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you so much for the vision you gave to Hiram Edson. And that although it was a great disappointment that they went through, it was also a great awakening to the great truths you would have them to know and to teach. Please help us, Lord, to, to respect and, and honor our past and to live up to the faith that Hiram Edson and James White and Ellen White had, that we might finish this work, Lord. Help us, in Jesus' name, amen.